Welcome to Around the Blockchain. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Hey, John, look, welcome to uh, Around the Blockchain. Look, if you don't mind just giving yourself um, and the viewers a bit of a brief introduction. Sure. Um, my name is John Will. I've, uh, I've kind of, my, my, my life thus far uh, has been around, all around martial arts. You know, I was into martial arts and stuff when I was in school, but, and I was told that, you know, I'd never amount to anything if I kept down that path and I should go to university and get a degree and do the normal thing. But I, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to follow my passion because I wanted to be happy. Um, so I ended up going over, as soon as I finished school at 17, I went overseas and trained pretty much in Southeast Asia for seven or eight or nine years, um, all through Indonesia, then eventually Malaysia, Thailand, and eventually I went to Japan and wrestled in India and did all that kind of stuff. And um, that, I was just a dojo rat or a mat rat uh, for that time. And, and then I started a magazine called Blitz Magazine, which is now defunct, it's, it, it's finished, but um, that was a magazine that I started uh, back, I forget, back in the late mid eighties, I guess, mid eighties. So that was um, Australia's best martial arts magazine. There was, there was two, but I put the other one out of business because I, I mean, I started my magazine to put them out of business because they wouldn't print an article that I wrote. So I overreacted and my wife's laughing. I overreacted to them not printing, wanting to print my article. So I, I, um, I started my own magazine and got rid of the other magazine, put them out of business. And then I, then I lost interest <laughs> uh, when that was done. So I sold it for a small amount of money, not much, but that, that magazine kind of funded me to, I didn't make much money, but I made, you know, I, I made, I made kind of the, the sort of same amount of money that you'd make working in McDonald's or something like that. But at least it, uh, it allowed me to pursue my passion, which was martial arts training traveling and interviewing very interesting people. And that's how I came across BJJ. I ended up going to Brazil, um, you know, and getting and, and doing articles on Brazilian Jiu Jitsu well before anyone knew what it was, like five years before the UFC started. How did you, uh, how did you, sorry, yep. sorry, how did you, um, who was the first person you met in Jiu Jitsu? And then I guess what sort of happened after that? First person I met in jiu-jitsu was actually, well, I was, I was writing an article. There was, a, there was a Brazilian guy out here who I never met, a guy called Marcelo Beiring. Um, He's dead now. A lot of them are because some of them were hanging out with the wrong crew and doing the wrong things and they're living that life. You've got to watch it. But he didn't watch it enough and ended up getting killed. But Marcelo Beiring was out here at the time and he was a surfer, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. And he put an art, he, someone wrote an article saying he'll challenge anyone to, for a fight for $50,000. This is back in 1985. No one had $50,000 for a start. And the second, thing, no one, you know, in the martial arts industry, come on. I mean, this, people were doing martial arts as a hobby. You know, there's no one with money doing martial arts. So it, nothing happened, but at least it, array, it raised my curiosity. And I, I kind of wanted to follow up on that one page article. So I ended up going to America to, to try to hunt it down because a friend of mine over in America said to me that they'd heard there was a couple of those Brazilian guys training in a garage in Torrance and that was Horry and Gracie. Um, and Hoist was a little kid. Um, and anyway, I went to that garage and did three or four, I did five lessons actually, private lessons. And the fifth of those private lessons on the Friday was with Hegan Machado. Hegan Machado was the national champion in Brazil at the time who Horry and had brought up to take some of the workload off the private lessons because he was doing like 40 or 50 a week. That's the only, there were no classes. At that time, there were no classes in BJJ. The only way you learned it was private lessons. So Hegan was teaching them and he taught me my fifth lesson, which I loved more than all the other lessons I'd had previous, the four prior to that. I went home, did some training in the jet center and some other places, but I went back to Australia, scraped together a bit more money, went back over there, to LA again, went to do one more private lesson at Horian's place with the intention of getting an address in Brazil because I figured in Brazil, it's gotta be cheap and I can live there for nothing. So I eat black beans and rice. Uh, so it won't cost me any money. So I went there to do my lesson 
and do an interview with Horian. And Hegan was there again. And he taught me the lesson. At the end of my lesson with Hegan, he said, don't train here. These guys, forget it. Go to Brazil. I went, that's exactly what I want to do. And he says, I'm going Wednesday. Come with me. So we kind of become good friends. And that's how I hooked up with the Machados and went down there. And everyone was in the same academy. Henzo Gracie, Hyan Gracie, Hillian Gracie, Carlos Gracie Jr., all five Machado brothers. They were all training in the one mat. So I was wow. hanging out with them. And that's how I started in BJJ. Yeah, wow. What a fascinating story. I've actually heard quite a few of your stories before. Um, but I want to sort of, yeah, obviously capture this for the viewers. So talk to me about Brazil. What was that experience like? I can imagine that would have been an awesome sort of time to be around, even just to be a fly on the wall, let alone participating in um, some of the action that was happening on the mat. So what was that sort of experience like for you? It was, it was really good. I mean, I was used to traveling and training in foreign cultures because, you know, I'd been to India and I'd spent a lot of years in Indonesia and I'd been to Thailand, Japan. So it wasn't foreign to me to train in an environment where no one speaks the same language as you. You soon fig you figure out who's the best one on the mat or on the dojo or whatever it is. You figure out who the top guys are and then you try to copy what they do. So that was my learning style. Modeling, you know, I've always been an autodidact in that I don't need much instruction. Um, I just need to look at people who are doing whatever they're doing. And I can, I seem to be able to model them reasonably well. So that's my style of learning. So it was just like part of the course, um, you know, and I, it was great. I, I didn't even know who I was with. Like it was only years later, I realized who, who my friends were. <laughs> um, I, I just thought they were my friends, you know, and. <laughs> you had no idea about who they, who they were and what their reputation was. No idea. I didn't have any idea. No idea. I mean, I remember, I remember the day I, I found out. I was sitting on the mat in Gracie Baja. Henzo Gracie was sitting next to me. He was a brown belt at the time. All these guys started walking in, like Fabio Gurgel and uh, Amori Bacchetti. Like these are, these are like well-known competitors at the time. And the, but they weren't from Gracie Baja. They were from different schools. And they started walking in and people were going, oh, that's this guy. Oh, that's that guy. And I turned to Henzo. I said, what, what's going on? What is it, what's going on today? Is this a special day? <laughs> and Henzo said, oh, no, they've come to train with him. And Hegan was sitting next to me. So I looked past Hegan and went, with who? Like, I'm trying to figure out why they're there. And they go, no, they've come to train with him. They go, what, with Hegan? And Henzo goes, yeah, they, they, they heard he's back in town. They want to come and train. He's giving a little seminar. And I go, Hegan? Like... <laughs> <laughs> And Henzo looked at me like I was slightly insane and went, don't, don't you know who he is? I go, my friend Hegan. He goes, you idiot. Like, you know, like he's the best guy in Brazil. I go, this guy. <laughs> and then I, you know, and then later on, I realized that Henzo himself, and I mean, all these guys were great guys, but I didn't know. They were just the guys I was hanging out with. So I lucked out. <laughs> at, at that time, so Hegan, um, you know, was obviously very, very well known within the jiu-jitsu community. Um, he was pretty well known for cross-training a little bit as well, um, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? That's right, um, because he was inspired by his cousin, Holes, Holes Gracie. Holes was pretty much most people would agree in the, in the, the old school BJJ guys, the best guy that ever was, was Holes. Um, everyone agrees with that. Um, he used to toy with some very big names. I'm not going to say it, but he 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 was extremely good. Um, and the reason why he was good is his mother worked for, if I'm not mistaken, Pan American Airlines. So she was based in New York. So he would go every couple of weeks to New York, free plane trips. But because he was into jujitsu, when he was in New York, New York, he wanted to train. So he took up wrestling and sambo. So Holes was cross training way back in the 70s. Yeah, wow. and, and, and in fact, became so good, I think he was given the role to create Brazil's national wrestling team for the Olympics. So he toured around Brazil teaching wrestling, not BJJ. Yeah. So he was one to mix all these things together. And he, that was Hegan's hero. And John Jacques. Uh, so they all looked up to Hollis, who was older than them. And 
they, they used to train with him. So Hegan naturally, you know, you want to follow in the footsteps of your hero. So he wanted to cross train. He wanted to do um, freestyle wrestling, Greco Roman wrestling, Sambo. Hegan wanted to do everything. So, and when they went to America, um, by the time 90, 90, around 1990, they were all came, came to America. They were, uh, Hegan was cross training in Greco and freestyle and Sambo and whatever he could. Yeah. So that and was around, just part of our. Sorry, John. And around about that time as well, um, when everyone started going from Brazil back to America, um, were you you were obviously you obviously followed suit and, and um traveled with Hegan as well, was that correct? I did. I, I, I went I went to Brazil one time without Hegan. Like when he was not there, he'd already gone to Brazil, his brothers had gone, the only one left down there was John Jacques. So, and I went to Gracie Baja because that's where I'd started training. And there was no one there. Like after the Machados left that academy, it just fell apart. Like there were only five guys on the mat, oh. two white belts, one brown belt, you know, and Carlos Gracie sitting in the corner on a punching bag on his phone, you know. So it was just, there was nothing. It was just destroyed. They had all left and everyone was there for them. Jean-Jacques had gone around the corner, started his own school. Um, I got sick of it. I went to there, for, I trained there for a week and a half or something at Gracie Baja. Carlos Gracie Jr. was no longer interested, it seemed to me, because I'd ask him a question. I'll never forget the answer. He says, if it work, if the guy taps, it's correct. It's technical. If he doesn't tap, it's not technical. I went, what? I'm out. So I called up Hegan and go, I can't train here anymore. There's no one here. Carlos Gracie Jr. doesn't seem to be interested. Where can I go? And Hegan goes, go outside, two blocks to the right, second door on the left, go in there. I go, okay. So I did that. And it's Jean-Jacques school. And I remember I called, he can go back. Why didn't you tell me your brother was teaching around? Like, what the hell, mate? And he goes, oh, yeah, you know, I forgot. It's like, what the hell? So I've gone in there and then everyone's there. That's where, that's where, that's where all the top guys had gone to. His mat was packed out for Jean-Jacques, very inspiring, interested. So I trained there for a bit. That was my last. And then very shortly after that, Jean-Jacques went to LA. He was the last one to go up and I had no reason to go back to Brazil anymore. And so you obviously followed suit and went through to America as well. How long were you in America and, and training there? Back and forth. You know, was, all my stuff was back and forth. You know, I'd, I'd have to come home and teach a little bit of martial arts for pocket money and live on rice and noodles and save all my money. And then enough to go over and train for another three months somewhere. It was like that. Yeah, okay. Pretty yeah. much the first 15 years of my life after school. What are you looking at my wife, looking at me funny? <laughs> and so, sorry, I you thought- I had no prospects, <laughs> none. <laughs> <laughs> you, you actually brought Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to Australia. Yeah. And you're part yeah. of a pretty prestigious group of people um, known as the Dirty Dozen, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. I and what was number then number nine, then ten, okay. then eleven, and then number twelve? Because some guys come out of the woodwork that were given a black belt, but they're not really black belts. They were like an old guy who'd done judo for thirty years and he trained and he, you know. And they go, oh, let's just give him a black belt to make it." You know, there's, there's a few of them in the mix. Okay. Um. So, so, my, so I, I was number eighth, eighth one, and then ninth, then tenth, then eleventh, then twelfth. At one point, I was out for a fortnight, and then <laughs> a thousand people jumped online and went, "That's bullshit. No way, he's back <laughs> in." So, <laughs> Yeah, apparently, yeah. I think I'm number twelve. <laughs> I scraped in. <laughs> <laughs> what um, what year did you bring jiu-jitsu to Australia? I mean, I, I bought it. I mean, in 1987 is when I started. 1986 is when I started training. So I was teaching stand-up martial arts here, but I was always cross-training. I was always into clinch, takedown, you know, and fighting a bit on the ground, even though I didn't know what I was doing. But I was always like that. I was like that since I was a kid um because every fight that i had ended up on the ground ground and pound you know so so i didn't want to give that up um so I, you know I, I was just teaching a bit of bjj to supplement you know my stand-up training and then over the years more bjj crept in and the stand-up kind of went to one side and then when i got my black belt which was in 1997 um that's when I really started to teach BJJ. 
Before you got your black belt, there's a pretty historic match of you fighting at Brown Belt. I think you were fighting one of the top guys from, was it Gracie Baja? Was it? Oh, D'Artagnan? Yeah. yeah maybe. There's, a, there's a really good story of you you were competing against one of the top, top guys um, who everyone sort of thought was going to smash you and you were doing really well. I think you were up on points and you were passing guard three or four times within the match. Um, That's true. Went, yeah. yeah. Can you talk about that story as well? I find that one really good. It was pretty bad. I mean, <laughs> it's a bad story. I, I was I wasn't ever a competitor. Um, in that, weirdly enough, I wasn't interested. But also, you got to remember, right? In those days, there wasn't like the competition pathway wasn't a pathway to anywhere. Like nowadays, you could argue that it is. You know, if you can become world champion now, you can you can you can do a few seminars and you, you know you. I don't think that they're doing very well, but but because they're not diversifying, they're not doing anything. Most of them are not doing what they should be doing, in my view. But because what they've got to realize is that next year there's a different world champion and then another one, and then they fall off, and everyone wants the new guy, and they're banana rama. They're not the Rolling Stones, and they can't make a distinction between those two fucking things. Um, <laughs> But rant over, we can talk more about that later. <laughs> uh, but people think that if they become a world champion, they've solved their life's problems. This, this is not true. Um, and I'll tell you all the reasons why afterwards. But there was, at that point, there wasn't even that glimmer of hope. So I didn't want to do that. Um, and there wasn't many competitions anyway. Whereas nowadays, my son, for example, no, he wants to be a competitor. He wants to fight on the world stage and be a world champion. So that, 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 that's something he understands also at the age of 21, that that's not how he's going to make his living. Like he's going to make his living by investing and which he's already doing and he'll be retired by the time he's 28. <laughs> but um, so he can do whatever the fuck he wants, you know, so he can do... He can, he, he can roll and be a world champion or take up fucking archaeology. It, does, it doesn't matter. Right? So they're, they're two separate things. But at that time, I wasn't interested in competition. And, and my instructors said to me, I remember the night they asked me, they said, we come in tomorrow. I'll get back to your question in a second. Yep. But they said, come in tomorrow. We're going to have a talk to you. Now, we're all going to be here, be here at 4.30. I went, oh, my God, what have I done wrong? <laughs> I thought I'd done something wrong. I was going to get told off because... Cesar Gracie did something wrong the week before. He punched some guy in the face a couple of times in rolling and made him bleed and they come and told him off and suspended him for a couple of months. I thought, shit, did I punch anyone last week? I thought I was in trouble. I came in, they're all there. I'm going, fuck, what did I do wrong? They said, we've got a serious question for you. I go, yep, what? <laughs> and they said, we want to ask you, do you want to be a competitor or do you want to be a coach? Choose. You can only be one or the other. If you could only be one or the other, pick one. And I remember thinking, well, I'm too old to be a competitor. I, I don't think that's true now. Now I don't believe that anymore. But at the time I was 30, I don't know, 34, 35. So I thought you have to start this shit when you're eight. Not true, but that's what I thought. So now, okay, I'll pick coach. I want to be the best coach, not the best competitor. And then... Hegan turned to John Jacques and he said, okay, we've got to teach him everything. <laughs> so I think, oh, shit, what if I had said competitor? And they go, we, then we just would have taught you an unstoppable guard pass and got you to do it a hundred thousand times, an unstoppable finish and an unstoppable sweep. And that's it. That's all you would have done. And maybe an unstoppable takedown. Like, and he's doing the same little game, you know, a thousand reps a week for two years and then you'll be great. But because you pick coach, we're gonna teach you right, within reason, everything there is to know about X guard, everything there is to know about omoplata, everything. I'm glad I chose that because I would have been bored shitless going down that other road. <laughs> um, anyway, so all of that is a way to say I wasn't a competitor. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I went in there, had this match with a guy called D'Artagnan who was always better than me, better guard, better stamina, better everything. But on that day, I was just doing well because I didn't care. I wasn't caring because um, I didn't want to be a competitor. So what do I care? 
And it was that, so that allowed me to relax and whatever. And I, I just had a role, but obviously he cared more than I did. So that made you second guess. You know, it's like when people invest in crypto, if they care about the price dropping down, that's a way, that's an indicator they've invested too much money. That's how you know yeah. they care too much. If you don't care, you can ride the shit out. I didn't care about the competing. So that allowed me to take risks and flow and all that. And I, I was way up. And the other, Carlson Gracie, the other team was on the other side. And they're all going, oh my God. Oh. And my, my team are already celebrating. They're all going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're going, ha, ha, ha. And they're laughing at the other team. And it was all like that. <laughs> and I was way up in points. I think I was up, I, I think nine points or something. And then it's like literally 10 seconds to the end of the match. And Hegan yells out, pass his guard again. Like why? I'm, it, it's like nine zero. So I go to pass his guard, my hand slipped in accidentally, triangle, which was his best move. And so the funny thing was the vibe went from my side all celebrating and the other side going, oh no, and it just reversed instantaneously. <laughs> and they all went mental and my guys went, oh my God. So that was like horrible. <laughs> what a good story. It is, it is a good story. And yeah, that was a it was a good match, and and he was really good. So, um, yeah, but I was never a competitor. I don't want anyone to misunderstand. Um, I wasn't into it. Um, you know, I mean, I'm I'm still not into it. Um, it's not important to me. There are other things that are important to me. Put it that way. I'm I'm into it to the point where, well, I, I guess I'm going to be more into it now because my son wants to compete and he's interested in that. Um, so naturally, I am in that way, but I don't care for my own self. I, my, my, the things that interest me and drive me are very different, not competition. What do you, so what do you think the reason for that is? So you obviously had that discussion um, at the gym and you either were gonna choose competitor or coach and you decided to go coach. What do you sort of think was the main reason behind you choosing to say coach? Um, at the time you said you thought it was maybe an age thing, but later on reflecting I, on that, it's sort of come yeah um purely because i'm interested i'm very curious about bjj so i want to know I, i'd rather go broad than deep yeah you know so rather than being myopic you pick the you know, what's your favorite takedown what's your favorite pass what's your favorite, and just working on that to get it to that world-class level which is a thousand reps a day five days a week you know blah 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 i i'm just not that way like, look, look behind me. My library hasn't got one book in it. You know, it's, I, I want to know. So I'm, I would be bored, Ryan. I, I would be bored. So yeah. I wanted to be interested and I'm curious and I'm not ADD, you know, I'm not all over the place, but I, I am, you know, I, I have a, a broad, a broad outlook on things. So I think I needed to do lots of different things to keep me interested. Yeah. Um, I think that's the main reason and to be a effective coach you know you have to be up like this morning someone was asking me about entries and problems with backside 50 50 heel hooks that's the question mm -hmm. so i i gotta know about that i gotta know something about it you know yeah. i'm not an expert on that like Lockie giles would be the one or something but i know enough to show him two or three really good entries, the main problems and how to overcome the problems. I know that. Now, I would never know that if that was, like, and I've heard this before from world-class competitors, you ask them a question, they go, oh, I don't do that. That's their answer. I don't do that. To me, that'd be like me going to a history professor at university and saying, can you tell me something about the, you know, the Chinese rebellion? And they go, oh, I'm sorry, I don't do Chinese history. I do American history what like like okay but not if you're a professor if, if you're a professor of history you need to know a little bit about every history like right and maybe okay have a special have specialize in, in you know in european history but you you, you can't tell me you don't know <laughs> the basics of everything so i think that's my that's that suits me that professor ish approach right you should know a lot about, a little about a lot, but 
But knowing a little about a lot should not preclude you from knowing a lot about a few things. Yeah. So you have a couple of areas of specialization, but you also know a little about everything. And I think that's also a good way to do life. You can be too specialist in life. Like we're going to see more and more of that, right? As we go on, people are specializing themselves into extinction. Blockbuster comes to mind and, you know, a digital camera store. And so there's lots of, there's lots of things that if you become a specialist, it can be a real fucking problem for you later on. Like, so I think you need to be adaptable and agile in today's world. And how do you be adaptable and agile? You know a little about a lot of things. Yeah. So I think that I think that's always been my way anyway. I remember I only got one certificate at school. It was the certificate for outstanding general knowledge in grade three. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's some part of me that's always been, you know, more broad than deep. But over time, you develop some depth here and there. You mentioned an interesting thing there as well. So um, being a specialist in something, going back to something you'd sort of said previously about world champions, is that sort of what you mean when, you know, it's maybe not um, all that it's cracked up to be to become a world champion? Okay, let's get clear on this. So. I, it, it's, an, it's a great thing. You know, it's like summoning Everest. It's, it's, a, it's a thing you do and that you can aspire to and people should. And it's fantastic and it's difficult. But don't mistake that for making a living. Like, that, that's the mistake. Oh, if I summit Everest, I'll, I'll be famous and I'll make a living. Really? Tell, name me the first five people to have summited Everest. You don't even know who they are. I mean, um, so making, getting your life sorted out. And I'm not saying making money's, like, like life's not about that, but that is an important part because it's going to buy you options to do what you want. Um, so, and I think, I think people, certainly a lot of Brazilians, and they might, they might be right from their particular perspective. If they can win a world championship, people will take notice of them and then want to get them for seminars and they'll make some money. But I don't see them making enough money. I don't see them making anything more than pocket money, you know, a lot of the time with a couple of exceptions and even them. They're, they're, I don't. I, I don't see it. <laughs> I, I don't see it. I, I didn't. I don't see it in the UFC. Um, you know, there's obviously some exceptions to the rule. You know, there's Conor, there's Conor McGregor's and there's a few people, but it's like movie actors. Ninety-nine point nine percent of them are going to be working a second job in McDonald's. That they're not making a living from this. And and the same thing with the martial arts and. The, and people who make the mistake of thinking, if I, if, I, if I just become world champion, all my problems will go away. That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> that's ridiculous. They may, they may have some opportunity to make some money, but even if they do, that's completely separate from learning what to do with that money, <laughs> um, how to leverage the opportunity into some lasting and meaningful life-changing things. This has all got nothing to do with um, points. <laughs> You've, um, yeah, you've mentioned a few interesting points there. So what do you sort of see money as then? Um, do you see it as more of a tool to kind of buy you uh, time to do the things you want to do? Or where, have you, where is your viewpoint on what money is and um, what it sort of means to you? I have never been that interested in making money. Like, it's, it's like you know, there's, you, I'm sure you know people, I know people, that's their thing. Like, I want to, I, I've got $5 million. I need to make it $10 million. You know, like I've never been that way. I mean, I've been interested in the point where when you've got nothing, then you're, then you're really interested. <laughs> you know, like, a, like if you've got nothing, a little bit of money can actually make you a lot happier when you have nothing. You know, you're living in a cardboard box, then a little bit of money can make you much, much happier. But there comes a point where a little bit more money is not going to, you know, if I made an extra half a million dollars this year, it, it, it in no way impacts my life. Like, there is, I couldn't tell. The only way I could tell is by asking my accountant or going online and going, well, oh, the number got bigger. I, 
it's ridiculous. Um, there, there comes a point, so it doesn't mean anything. So I, I think that you need to be fiscally responsible. And I, I see a lot of people are not, especially in the martial arts space. I don't know if it's especially in the martial arts space, but that's the space I inhabit. So I see the people in that space. And I, I see a lot of them that are fiscally irresponsible. They are selling, they're spending more money on their lifestyle than what they're making. So that's just upside down. It's just stupidity. Um, now, I, so I think for me, one of the nice, like I'm, I'm, I am retired. I, um, a few years ago, I just retired, meaning I don't have to work for money anymore for the next 100 years. <laughs> so what does it mean? What it means to me is that now if I do, if I come to the mat and do the work, I'm doing it because I want to do it and want to be there. So that, that, that should be the reason. Like, you know, in a perfect world, the reason I come over to, I was over in Perth where you are a little while ago yep. and I was there. I wasn't, I was there because, not because I needed the money at all. It's nothing to do with it. I was there because, because I don't. So if I'm there, I'm there because I want to be there and I enjoy some of the people that I'm interacting with there and I enjoy teaching and I enjoy people spending time on the mat with people who like to train and are appreciative of that, appreciative of that. So, and that should be my reason, but also it should be, you should like that as well. Whoever's on the mat, they, they should want someone, they shouldn't necessarily want someone there who's only there because you're going to give them some money. You, you should want someone on the mat that's there because they're genuinely interested. So I think it's to be fiscally responsible and sort yourself out financially is actually a benefit to everyone, <laughs> not just me, but for you too, because now you've got a guy there who's, you know, if you gave me $10 billion tomorrow, I'd still be there. Like, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's not, I'm there for the right reasons and you should like, you should want that, right? Absolutely. Then some guy who's a world champion, and the only reason he's talking to you <laughs> is because you're paying him some money. That's still good, but it's not as good as him wanting to be there because he's he likes it. That's much better. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I think I think everyone should be fiscally, I think everyone should be financially independent because then we'll see, we'll see uh, what they really like doing. <laughs> And we'll know their real reasons. That do you understand? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a a great sort of you mentioned some great things there. Um when did you first sort of get into investing? Well, as I said, I wasn't interested. So what I like to do with things I'm uninterested in is automate them. So, you know, it like if I could make it automatic, um, if I'm uninterested in it, it still happens, right? So I wanted to automate my, my financial stuff. So how do you do that? I, I got interested in, okay, to, to answer your question, um, my father took me along to see my brother who was, who was one of those old school financial advisors. You know, the guys who just take their evil trailing commission for the rest of your life by giving you, for giving you bad advice about investing. Um, so he took me to see him. He was a good one. Um, and, and he spent four or five hours with me and his whiteboard and graphs and, you know, showing different things. But all I took from it, which was the right thing, was save 10% of everything you earn it doesn't matter what, if you only earn a hundred bucks, you do not spend 10, no matter what. If you earn a thousand dollars a week, you, 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 you save a hundred. If you earn 10,000 a week, you know, you save a thousand dollars. And you, and I was about, how old was I? 30 in my mid thirties. So late, quite late. Um, I didn't have any money at that point. So I, I, I just started doing it. And then I read, I read The Richest Man in Babylon, which basically says the same thing. I saved 10% of, 
of everything you earned and invest that so that we, we, we get earnings, you know, on the earnings. Good book to read, but just save 10%, you'll be good to go. Um, but you, people aren't interested in these fortune cookie kind of ideas. They, so you've got to tell a story about chickens and goats and fucking guys in Babylon and how it all works. But, but that, so I started doing that. So, you know, if I earn a hundred bucks, I, I, I put away 10. Um, and then, you know, that worked for me. And then, then, then as I kind of got a bit more involved, I, I didn't put away 10, I put away 20. Cause I was older. And I think if you're older, 10 is not enough. You've got to be putting away 20%. And then I went, fuck, that's not enough. 50%. And then nowadays it's like 99%. Because <laughs> like I only need 1% to live my life. And the, the rest just, and then it just, you know, piles up. But um, that's the advice I would give to anyone who's young. Save 10%. But I wouldn't say 10. I'd say try to, try to save 20. So I started doing that. And I started doing it with superannuation. You know, superannuation. Yeah. Yeah. So for those, anyone's listening to this, who's not from Australia, superannuation is like American 401k or like the New Zealand Kiwi Saver, which is, you know, your money just goes in before tax into a, a um, government approved fund and it stays in there and you can't access it until you retire. Um, and then there's big tax advantages for that. And in Australia, we've got the best ones in the world that I think because when you retire, the tax goes to zero. I don't, I don't pay tax. It goes yeah. to zero. And no capital gains tax, which is awesome if you own crypto in there <laughs> and things like that. So, um, yeah. Anyway, we can and go more into it. Dig in, but. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, at what point did you get into crypto then as well? Oh, quite late. I mean, I started with, I started with just in my superannuation, like AMP, you know, some shit superannuation. <laughs> until I got a couple hundred thousand dollars in there, you know, over about 15 years, whatever. And then I, then I did the math. I, I, I soon talking to a few people, I realized that anyone that knew, knew about finances did not do that. They had their own self-managed super fund, yeah. meaning their own super fund. They would, they would, which you can do in Australia. You can make your own, you can get a company, cost you two grand, cost you a tax return and an audit every year. So there's another thousand dollars. So it costs you a thousand dollars a year to run it. And you can decide, you can roll your super into that. And now you can decide where you invest your money. That is way better if you've got half a brain. Your returns are better and you're flexible and agile. You can do what you want. But I did my super for a while and then I built up in there and then I bought some properties with it and paid them off. And then, then I wanted to diversify instead of just having shares, which I've got shares and properties. Instead of that, I, I'm uninterested in shares. It's boring. I don't want to, I, I don't know what Qantas is doing today or BHP, like whatever. It's not interesting to me. There's no story there unless someone drops dead. Um, you know, there's nothing, it's nothing on the news. You know, it's, it's, it's uninteresting. And I think it's good to invest in things you're interested in. Absolutely. Because if you're interested, you pay attention. And if you pay attention, you start making good decisions. So I've made much better decisions with the things I've been interested in than the, whatever the financial advisors have told me. Um, so after getting a good, you know, shares and property, I then said, well, I'll put 1% of my portfolio. <laughs> 1% that is very conservative. In other words, I'll, what can I afford to lose and not even know I've lost it? Well, 1%. <laughs> Anyone can afford to put 1%. So put 1% into crypto. And I, I, I did that four years ago. And I bought Ethereum, for those who know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Cardano. So I did pick three good ones. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I think they're both, they're all in the top four or five market cap now but so i put i put some money into that you know 30k or something 35k not not, not that much but, um and and because i put it in there i was interested in it so then i start following it and learning a little bit and you know um and th that's it i don't trade or anything i've just kept it there and watched it <laughs> watched it grow 
And then this year I bought some more because it's the new, for those who know crypto, you know, four year cycles. Um, not that I know too much about crypto. I'm not an expert or anything like that, but you know, it pretty much it, there is a pattern. Of course, that's no guarantee that pattern will continue, but historically there's been a pattern of accumulation. Everyone jumps in, thing booms up. They make so much profit, they can't help but sell, like Elon did and tweeted about it. They, so they, they sell, <laughs> then price starts dropping down because everyone's selling because they've just made so much money that it drops, gets momentum. It doesn't go back to where it started. It drops down to that point, And then you get a year of accumulation. Then you get the halving of Bitcoin, which makes it more rare. So suddenly price starts going up, everyone accumulates, and then it goes it again. So something like that. Um, uh, and... So I bought, I, I bought last time for this cycle, but I bought this cycle for the next cycle. So I picked two this year with no intention of even looking at it until 2025. And by the way, they are Polkadot and Super Farm, if you care. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually just about to ask you what they are and what, um, you know, what sort of due diligence did you sort of go into to make the decision to you know, invest in those? Well, I don't know about NFTs and whatever, but I am an early adopter. And sometimes I will jump into an idea way before I understand the idea. <laughs> that's why, that's what makes, I think that's perhaps the addition, the definition of an early adopter. I jumped into BJJ seven years ahead of the UFC and 17 years ahead of everyone else. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't jump in because I understood it. I jumped in because I didn't understand it. Now, people are all talking about non-fungible tokens and um, NFTs and, you know, one-off digital arts. And I know Super Farm is uh, um, one of the ones I looked at where I thought they seem to have a good team. They're interested in that. I don't know. If this NFT thing takes off, they could be good. So that was my reason for jumping into super farm but the other one polka dot again i don't know much about it but i know that you know ethereum was internet 2.0 cardano's internet 3.0 or blockchain 3.0 i'm sorry and i like charles hoskinson i listen to him i'm interested in what he's got to say and i'm much more interested in the projects and what he's doing in Africa and trying to bank the unbanked and get everything on the block. I like the guy's vision. Yep. So for the same reason, I, I put, I think that Ethereum, Polkadot and Cardano are all similar. Yeah. Um, so I've got all of those because they're all similar and I don't know, know which horse is going to win the race, <laughs> except that I think it will be Cardano. <laughs> yeah, um, <me> too. <laughs> but, but I think Ethereum was great for its day and it's done really well. But I think if I had to pick one, it, I, I call Cardano, my, I, I told my wife, Cardano is like my, she said, why are you buying that? What, what's that about? I go, that's, baby, that is like, I've, I've wrangled a zebra off this African savanna. This was four years ago. I've somehow got him into the stall at the Melbourne Cup. He is facing the wrong way. <laughs> he looks funny and he's biting other horses on the ass. I just think he's going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> God, well, this will be funny. And then the gates opened up. My horses, the zebra's running the wrong way. It's fucking kicking a bucket. And, uh, but right as of today, I think it's coming second. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's looking good. So I, I did it as a hobby and I bought it when it was whatever. Not much. I spent $1,000. It's now at like 66K or something. But wow. I didn't buy it. I mean, it was, is it, okay, it was an investment, but it was more of an interest in the, the space. And, you know, that's what I'll do when we finish today. I'll have a coffee and I'll see what Charles Hoskinson's got to say today, yep. if anything. And it's an interest, you know, Ryan, it's an interest, right? So I take an interest in that. Whereas Qantas, BHP, you've got to be fucking joking. I'm uninterested. Mm -hmm. I couldn't give a shit. Uh, so I think we need to have interests in life and, if your interests can combine with income, then that's like a total bonus, right? So it's kind of interesting to me. But sorry, back to Polkadot. So I put Polkadot. I knew Polkadot was in that basket 
the theory of Kanar polka dot, but polka dots seem to be much more about cross chain, like there's different blockchains, and I don't understand it because I'm an idiot, so keep <laughs> that in mind. But there's there's different chains, and polka dot had a big focus on interoperability or being able to connect up these chains. Now, even though I don't know what that exactly means, it sounds really good. <laughs> so it sounds unique. And I thought, you know what, that's enough for me. I just like the sound of that. So I put a, you know, not much, five or six grand in, but that, I, it's not for now. Let me look at it in 2025 and see what's going on. So that's where I put Super Farm and Polkadot as like, I'm not even, I'm just watching Cardano now, but let's look in 2025. We'll, we'll have another conversation and we'll see where Polkadot and Super Farm are. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I like how you mentioned as well that you are quite interested in what Charles Hoskinson has to say, um, as well as the vision for Cardano he has as well. Um, funnily enough, I watch a lot of his stuff um, and I've had this conversation with a few people now where it's more about looking at the person behind the project and where they sort of see things going. Um, rather than looking at the project and, and what it's doing right this very like instant. That's, I think that's quite sort of important to differentiate between someone who's looking at investing for a longer period of time. So they have a longer sort of time, time preference and time horizon rather than someone who's trying to make you know, a quick buck right this very second. And I think Charles Hoskinson has some really good, um, obviously things to say on YouTube. He's actually got some really, really interesting um, discussions that he's posted. But more importantly, I think him behind the Cardano project, um, you know, the vision that he has for that particular project, you know, is world changing, I believe. Um, like you've just said, banking the unbanked in Africa, a lot of the stuff that he's doing there, I think, you know, people should have a look at. I think um, it's going to be one for the future. I think he's definitely in the space for the right reasons as well. He seems to be looking at, you know, changing the world, sort of going back to, you know, things you were talking about with, um, you know, a world champion versus, um, like someone who's a coach and then you know if you could take away the aspect of money so would that world champion still be coaching people if money wasn't involved I think Charles Hoskinson sort of falls along that um, sort of uh, yeah. falls within that basket I guess because you know he's a, he's a billionaire he doesn't need to work he doesn't need to do anything he could literally do whatever he wanted for the rest of his life and what he wants to do is try and you know be an influential figure and help all these people in Africa and I just sort of find that vision um, and the man himself, I find that, you know, what he's doing um, very interesting and very valuable. Um, so yeah, that's my two cents on, on Cardano. I, yeah, I'm in agreement. I, I, you know, you find yourself attracted to people who are, um, you know, have similar views. But I also do the hard thing, which is I try to listen to people who had the exact opposite view. Like if I looked at something on Cardano, I will go, I'll, I'll look at, you know, why people hate it or don't want it. I like to get that perspective because I want to get both. So I have a form, I form very strong opinions, but I hold them lightly. I want to be able, I want, I would love my mind to be changed because if you can change my mind on my view, that means you've got some really good views. Absolutely. Um, so, so I like that saying. I, that's not my saying. I heard that somewhere. I have very strong opinions, but I hold them lightly. And I think it's really good. That might be my little quote for 2021. <laughs> um, but I, I do like the reason I chose Cardano or Charles Hoskinson was because I think that guy's outlook is similar to mine. He doesn't need the money anymore. So... What, why is he doing what he's doing? You know, and I, I'm like that. So I, I think, fuck, I resonated with that. Shit, that's, that's the way I think. I want to listen to this guy. And he, and he was like that four years, you know, when I first listened to him four years ago, that's what got me on it. I thought, shit, I like this guy. <laughs> um, and he wasn't clearly, he's like, he's about the work. Put your head down, lift your ass up. I don't care about the market. I don't care about the price. I'm interested in that. We've got work to do here. You guys can rush it and get it out to market. I don't care. We, we want to do the job really well. Thought that sounds like me. Like you know, it's, so, I'm with him. You know, and that that's why I chose it. And the more I listen, the more I realize, yeah, I, I think I chose right. And the, I think it's going to do really well. You know, financially. But again, that's not, not my motivation. It's it's good that it is though. Um, 
but that wasn't my reason. That's yeah. a that's a that's a that's a byproduct. It, it's like Buckminster Fuller once said, who Robert some people on this channel might know who Robert Kiyosaki was. Yes, who wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad. I knew Robert Kiyosaki forty years ago when he was just starting out. He was doing talks, seminars, and I did some of his seminars. He invited me along as a guest, actually. And um, it's another whole story. But <laughs> his his um, mentor was a guy called Buckminster Fuller, who wrote a book called The Critical Path. And what Buckminster same thing. Buckminster Fuller, independently wealthy, genius, inventor, but he. He says the key to it is to make the world better. Like you're contributing to make the world better. And his analogy was a bee goes about its business. A bee goes out there and it is being a bee because it just collects honey. So it's, its purpose is to collect honey or pollen. But while it's collecting the honey and pollen, it's doing cross pollinization of flowers. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a giant benefit that's happening because it's true to its purpose. And I think that Charles Hoskinson's like that. He, he's got this purpose. I've got a sense of purpose. And how you know that your purpose is good is because all these other things happen that are considered to be good things because you're on track. And how you know that you're not doing what you, you how you know that you're, you're off the path is that lots of bad shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you keep getting hit by Matt trucks and you can't fucking work it out that maybe you've gone off the path onto the freeway, but how you know you're on your path is good shit happens. Um, and one of those things is, oh, the investment goes up, but it's only an indicator. It's not why you're doing it. It's not why you're going out and collecting the pollen. It's just an indicator that yes, you're, you're on the right path. Oh, you Idiots would say the universe is looking after you, <laughs> but they would be fucking stupid. But that that's cute, and, and it's easy for them to say that. But um, it's just not true. Like that, the, it's un, unintended consequences is are real things, <laughs> and in fact, you can read about them in economics white papers if you're so interested. But the easiest way is just to say that the universe is manifesting it for you and read the secret like a moron. <laughs> I want to circle back. You, um, uh, you made a really interesting point about your son, uh, Felix. So he started investing. He's only 21. Um, you said he's got a pretty big interest in doing some big things, um, you know, within the BJJ world, um, wanting to sort of aspire to be a world champion. But I want to kind of go back to, um, you know, what you said about him starting to invest now as a 21 year old and, potentially being retired by 28. Would you mind talking a little bit about, you know, what he's doing, what his mindset is and, and what sort of, I guess, his outlook on investing is? Um, his, his, his job, like the last, up until quite recently, he was just stacking shelves at Woolworths. <laughs> He's right there. Uh, um, he worked hard stacking shelves at Woolworths Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, like just four hours a day. But you don't make a lot of money stacking shelves at Woolworths, but what you do make money on is investing the money that you earn stacking the shelves at Woolworths and buying Qantas shares. What else you got, son? Webjet, Fang, meaning Facebook, Amazon, Google, and Netflix. What else you got? Espo, which is a gaming ETF exchange traded fund, but centered around gaming, yeah. right? ARK Invest, if anyone knows Kathy Woods over in the States, you got some ARK, haven't you? Yeah, ARK W. Um, ARK Invest, which is Kathy Woods, and she invests, for those who don't know, um, she's a very smart lady over in America, and, and she's got an exchange traded fund, which is a parcel, a, a basket of shares. I'm sure I'm sure you know probably more, more about it than me, but, um, and, she invests in, in, in disruptive innovation. Um, so Felix, and she's got, I think five funds or it might even be six now, I'm not sure, but five different ETFs. And Felix has invested in, which one? The World World Web, Archi yeah. So uh, anything to do with the web, which includes, includes um, the um, currency of the internet, Bitcoin and um, all of these things. So he's, he's kind of like doing that. 
and he's got some crypto. Yeah. What do you got? Ethereum, Bitcoin. I, no, I, I gave him some bad advice. Don't listen to your father. Um, what do you got? Bitcoin. He's just got Bitcoin. But, but Bitcoin's fine. Uh, so, yeah. So he, he's kind of just got all that there. And, and now, it, now he stopped at Woolworths because it's getting pretty good. And, then, and now he just teaches private lessons and teaches class. The kid, helps my wife teach the kids' classes at the school. But it's not, again, I, I would say that his, his view, which is pretty close to my view, is that it's not just, the, it's not how much money you earn. It's what you do with it. Getting back to the richest man in Babylon. It's not, it's not saving the 10% of your money that you earn every week and burying it in the ground where it's depreciating at a rate of, if you're an idiot, you'd say 4%. If you're Michael Saylor, you'd say 15 to 20%. I think the reality is probably somewhere in the middle, you know, yeah. um, 10% a year, it's losing value at 10% a year, 10, 10 years later, you're not going to be able to buy much with that money. So no, you put it into something that's, that's going to maybe grow. You know, you're, you're making a bet that Facebook's going to turn into a thing. Google's going to turn into a thing. You're making bets like that. Um, you're betting on the future. And we like that. We, we like betting on the future. Um, I mean, I bet on the future when I was doing BJJ, you know, started out. I'm betting on a future that hasn't happened yet. You know, and sometimes you'll get it wrong, but when you get it right, you, you tend to really do well. So you can kind of get it wrong once and right once and you'll do really well if you're betting on how the future's going to unfold. That's our personality. Our personality is to look forward, try to see where it's going. So I think... You know, if you read sci-fi, you probably do better than if you read history. <laughs> a lot of people would disagree with that statement, but um, you know what I mean. Sci-fi, you, you know, you're thinking, you're trying to make guesses as to what the future will be like. History, you're looking at what happened before, will it happen again? Well, But we are living in a period where what's happened in the past is no longer that much of an indicator about what's happening in the future. It's... I think it's a little bit tilted toward the people that can make a guess as to how the future is going to unfold. Where do you see the future for, you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general um, based off of what you've just sort of said then? Oh, I think it's early days. I think, you know, people go, oh, Bitcoin's too expensive. Oh, hang on. You don't have to buy one. You can buy 0.001. I mean, you know, if I had any brains and I had the inclination, I, I would I would put out a coin, tether it to Bitcoin, call it milli Bitcoin, where it was uh, one thousandth of a Bitcoin. Why doesn't someone do that? Fuck, it's a simple idea. Because if you put out that coin that's tethered to Bitcoin, and it was only it was only 70, what is it now? It was only $58, you would buy it. But people are put off by the price point because they're not smart enough to work out that they can just buy a little bit. Um but I think it's the I think it's still early days. I, I I think you know we're at the we're at the same point with the cryptocurrency now that we were with the internet in the year two thousand. Um, so I think that we'll look back ten years from now and go, oh my god, why didn't I see that? Um, and people like Charles Hoskinson are making this a reality. And then of course this year they call it the year of the institutional money. So. It, uh, I don't think Elon's helping, but, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's off-putting when a whale, when, when someone can move the market by a tweet, that's that is right. off-putting. And it's, I don't think it's helpful to the space. What we want is the opposite to that. We want to have so much liquidity in there that it's 10 or 15 years from now, no one can move the market. Um, you know, and, and, and it'll just go up and down by half a percent a day. I mean, that's what we want. And I, I, we're not there yet. We, we, are, we are flood, famine, up and down, all over the place. And people don't like that. Um, they don't like the volatility. But I will take volatility if it's giving me 300% return a year. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, but that's not that's easy to say. It's not it's not easy to do because you, you have to be actually able to do it. And people go, Yeah, I can do it. And I see when I look around, the people that are saying I can do it can't do it. As soon as the price drops, they freak out and sell. 
And as soon as it goes up, they freak out and sell. <laughs> yeah. so, so, um, so I, I, I think you've got to be able to deal with the volatility and hang in there, but not, not everyone's capable of doing it. I was having this discussion with, with Felix last night, actually. I, said, I was telling him, how do you know you've invested the right amount? You could, I'll tell you how you know. You hang in there when it turns to shit. That's how you know you invested the right amount. How you know you've invested too much is that you feel a need to sell and freak out. <laughs> Right, so yeah, you know you've invested. Everyone says invest what you can afford to lose. It's so easy to say, but people pick the wrong number because when I see them freaking out, I go, you clearly invested too much money. <laughs> <laughs> right, how you can tell that you, you've invested the right amount of money is you don't give a shit if the price drops 20% because your philosophy of where this is going long-term will carry you through. Absolutely. I totally agree with all that. Look, I won't keep you much longer. I just wanted to know um, or for the viewers, actually, for the viewers' sake, do you have any sort of closing thoughts? Uh, with regard to what? Crypto? Yeah, with regard to crypto um, or jujitsu or, or life, any, any of those sort of three main pointers, up to you. With crypto, um, you know, I think if you've got a lot of money to invest, like, you know, you want to invest a hundred grand or something, then I would do, do, do the, treat it like any other investment strategy. I would diversify. You know, you want to go, you know, get, get, get five or six good blue chip cryptos. If you've got no money, like have, you've got 500 bucks and you want to start out in crypto, I'm not a financial advisor, blah, blah, blah. But if you only have 500 bucks, I would, I, I would, no, I would take a bet. I, I would pick one that interests you and follow it. Put all your eggs in one basket is what I would do. You know, put your 500 bucks on me, it would be Cardano, but whatever um, interests you and you believe in, put it all there. Don't diversify $500. But if you had a lot of money, I think it's silly to put, I would not put all of my assets on Cardano, no matter how much I love it. I think that's a silly thing. I'll be safe. I want property, shares, crypto, you know, but um, if I only had a thousand dollars to my name, I'd put it all on Cardano. I'd, or I'd put it all on my Apple stand or my lemonade stand. I, I'd put it all in, you know, all of my effort and intent on one thing. Yeah. I think that's what I got to say about crypto. Um, and, and, and just wait, like everything's a 10 year plan. Now with crypto, it, can seem like it's a two week plan, right? <laughs> but no, I think you need to have a, a longer view. And my view for crypto is a four year view. Um, so I'm, as I said, I bought this year for four years from now, not, not, for, not for this year. I haven't bought Polkadot for what's gonna happen this week. I'm not even looking at it. I'm looking at Cardano because I'm interested. But um, so, so I think, Invest for a four-year plan. Put something in and don't just don't worry about it. Just ignore it. Uh, Jiu-jitsu, you could say the same thing, right? I mean, if you're only if you're only training one hour a week, so you've only got five hundred bucks. You only got one hour a week. Pick a topic and work it, and get really good at it. In other words, drill down on one topic. Be good. If you're training ten times a week, well, you know you can you can diversify and try to cover off a whole lot of things. So you could kind of tie those two things together. And then again, you know what I'm going to say, same thing for life. Um, so I think you can diversify or you can drill down, depends on the amount of time or money or effort that you want to put in. Oh. So, um, yeah. No, awesome. Look, John, it's been, been good. I really appreciate your time as well. Thanks so much um, for jumping on. No worries, of course. No problem. My yeah. pleasure.